So today I will talk about database schema migration for lazy bones from chaos to heaven. Um, it's a talk that tells a story, so I will be a little bit short in time, so please keep your question for the end of the, the, the talk because maybe the answers are later in the talk. Um, a little um, word about me, I'm Julian Ryu, I work for uh, Howie Edge Cloud as an open source DBA. You can find already my slides on my website and you can follow me on uh, Mastodon if you want. Uh, today we are going to talk about the basics of schema migrations, uh, what we do at Howie Edge Cloud and especially uh, the context around uh, the situation which was back in the days more or less the chaos. We have implemented schemas code, CI CD, code reviews. Uh, we have, we will talk about automation and inventory uh, uh, to, to come to the heaven and a little bit uh, open to the future. So the basics. Um, we need to talk about a schema. A schema is a set of relations, so you can have multiple tables with foreign keys, uh, tables can have columns, and this represents the schema. And as business evolves, you, you have also schema evolutions. You have to create new tables, new columns, uh, new constraint, and new everything, all the time. And schema migration is the process of uh, going from one state to another, and for that, for uh, the example, here we have two tables, one with the customer, and we want to add a column to the customer table. And for that, we have the DDLs, the data definition language, which is basically alter statement, create, drop, and uh, those statements that require a higher level of privileges. Um, the statements can lock, uh, can have a, a really um, a high impact on the service, so you should be aware, uh, you should take care when you run them. And who we are? We are OVH Cloud. We are a cloud provider in Europe. Uh, we offer various cloud services, and when they have one thing in common, uh, they, at some point, uh, direct point, they use Postgres databases, but not only Postgres, also MySQL. But the databases here are mission critical. If one of the databases is down, the service will be impacted for the customers and we lose money, and money um, is Im really important for the business. <laughs> so. I'm not talking about the public databases, like we, we also have offerings, uh, of uh, various databases. I'm talking about the internal databases that runs every product. And I'm part of the team managing those databases. A little bit about statistics. We have seven autonomous infrastructure around the world, uh, mainly in Europe, but we also have uh, in Canada and in US. Uh, this represents hundreds of clusters um, spread around uh, with uh, 500 servers and more and 2,000 databases. As I said, we have MySQL and Postgres and a little bit of MongoDB, but this is off topic. And the most important point, we manage those databases in highly secure environments. Um, to mention, we have PCI DSS uh, restrictions, and uh, this is the goal. So databases are really important for the business, so we have implemented um, clusters of uh, servers with two nodes in a replication, in semi-synchronous replication, and a, a third node t in asynchronous replication, which is not accessible by the application, we used it for taking GFS snapshots and do backup and recovery procedures. 
and we have a bunch of load balancer in front of uh, the nodes uh, just for high availability, and we use a virtual IP. And this is a cluster example. We have hundreds of them. So at the beginning, when I joined the company eight years ago, it was more like a startup, uh, at least in the mindset. Uh, we were every, every developers and uh, ops uh, were in the same room. And when some developer wanted to add a feature, uh, just come to my desk or the team desk to say, hey, I want to do this. Can you help me? And of course, even at that time, we didn't allow them to run DDL statement because of previous outages. So we were on the same open space. They come to my desk and can you do this? OK, we run SSH, PSQL to the database. We try to understand what the developer wanted to, us to, to do. And we run a query and job done. Okay. What could go wrong? <laughs> First, where is the database? OK, uh, but I, I know because uh, I, um, by repetition, we can know where the databases are, are by heart. But OK, we lose time. Sometimes we misunderstood what the developer wanted us to do. So we run the query, and oops, it wasn't that. OK, um, I've run the query here. Uh, let's deploy the application. Oh, you forgot one environment. OK, uh, oops. <laughs> and OK, let's do this in a transaction, uh, without transaction, because by default, there is no transaction. And one query in the middle of multiple queries that failed. So how? So let's use transaction. OK, but at the end, you need to commit or roll back if you want. But uh, forgot to commit. Let the uh, session open. And uh, oops, uh, take a grab a coffee and uh, oh, get page. Oh, wh what's, uh, what's going on? And sometimes the query we think uh, would be very short, takes a long time, and locks everything down. And uh, in the end, even the permission system could be broke, broke because we forgot to set some special rules to apply the privileges on some new relations, and the new relations aren't accessible. <gasps> And at the end, the developer wanted to blame the DBAs. OK, you messed up. Sure. <laughs> what can we uh, improve? At the very beginning, we wanted to track the changes by using ticketing system. At that time, we had OTRS to create. OK, uh, we have the hello message and eventually some secret statement. But we also had Jira at the same time to do basically the same. So we had multiple ticketing system for multiple teams. Uh, secret statements are sometimes badly formatted. Uh, this doesn't prevent from bad copy paste. So you, when you select from the nice, what you see is what you get uh, uh, editors, you can mess up your, 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 your secret statement. And it's a poor reviewing system. So we move on, and we decided to use schema as code. And one thing the developer uh, likes like is the Git, uh, Git repositories. So we decided to put every schema in uh, one uh, Git repository per database at first. and. For some databases, we use multiple um, one repository for multiple databases because some databases share the same schema. Uh, it could be on different environment or even multiple databases if they are somewhat sharded, they share the same table and structure. And we have 534 repositories today. 
And to apply those uh, migrations, we decided to use SQL Migrate, which is a schema migration tool for, uh, for Go, but there is a, a CLI that we can use. And it's open source. You, you can use it if you want. So from the developer point of view, uh, the only thing they need to do is to create what we call migrations. Those are files, uh, SQL files, um, with two steps, one for the moving forward, which is the up migrations to create a table here, and the down migration to roll back eventually. So achievement unlocked. We speak the same language, which is SQL, no more translation error. So we use one file for one migration, and it, the tool automatically creates a transaction under, under the hood. So there is no need to specify begin and commit, it's built in. But sometimes we need to disable them because of technical reason. For example, Postgres doesn't allow to run create index concurrently inside the transaction, so we can disable it by using a hint. And the contract uh, with our developer is we focus on uh, DDLs and DDLs only, not DML. So what's inside the databases uh, in terms of data is managed by the application and you should handle it yourself. We focus only on the DDL, which is most critical part. If you lose data by running DDLs, we can restore the data by uh, restoring uh, from the backups. And now we have atomicity, okay. And from the DBA point of view, we have uh, a, a tool that is SQL mi migrate at first, but we have created a, wra a wrapper to implement some missing features uh, that applies only for us, which is handling the set role uh, statement. And a little bit of orchestration around uh, a migration because we have multiple paths that we can use. The first one is the admin path to declare extensions, uh, which is run by super user. And the second one is the, the common one. Uh, a lot of databases only has the normal path, but uh, we have to handle both. Which is the normal path is the one that runs uh, to create objects using uh, the, the, the right privilege. And it goes like this. Um, we give um, a configuration file and we have multiple operations. We can do a status, up or down, and we have all the migrations that have been applied, which is the file name, and when it has been applied. So if we run multiple times, it will skip the already applied migrations. Uh, data is uh, in the database. There is no, it's not in the, the file. The file contains only the DDL statement. Yeah. Right, so if I do a create table, alter table in database X, is the migration history stored in database X or stored in some This, this, the, uh, this is a special table inside the database. Inside the database? Yeah, yes. Where, where uh, the migration is applied. So yes. So now we have good permissions. And for code reviews, we use uh, developers at the time and right now use Bitbucket, which is the tool chosen by the company. So we wanted to have only one single point of, uh, uh, for everyone, so we use it. It's a Git-based collaboration tool, and unfortunately, it's not open source. But it has a lot of features we can use here, like comments, uh, blocking tasks. For example, some migrations are not finished. They are work in progress. They can block the merge uh, operation by creating blocking tasks. And we can review, of course, by approving or 
uh, say that the migration need works. And what's interesting is we can enforce some rules to have multiple approvals. Uh, of course, we want the DBA team to, at least one member of the DBA team to approve, so we are blocking the process, but on purpose. And sometimes the databases are modified by developers that are not owners of the database. So for that, we require an approval of the database owner. So we are safe like that. But it slowed down the process a bit for security. And there is a UI when we can comment right inside the code. It's pretty much like GitHub or any anything, and we can uh, click OK and merge. It's a convention that we try to enforce uh, inside, but you can uh, name your file as you want. They will be sorted alphabeti uh, alphabetically, but you can name them as you want. So now we can provide expertise. But this doesn't prevent from bad syntax or if we run the query, uh, the statement directly on the database, even if you have a tool, it will run what's inside the file. And if the file is bad, it will fail. So we don't want to, to reach production with a failing uh, code that has been merged. So for that, we use CI CD. And a little bit about uh, terminology CI is continuous integration. Uh, that meant to test locally, ensure the software or migrations are deliverable, and merge changes into the main branch. Continuous delivery is to, from that branch, you build a release, and continuous deployment is you build a release and deploy automatically. So for us, we only use the continuous integration and the test locally, uh, for continuous integration part because we, d we don't trust the software that we use to reach directly the databases to deploy the, the, the thing. We want to keep control of that deployment. So first, we have implemented tests without any data. And for that, we use CDS. It's a tool that we have built to uh, create um, for a CI CD platform. It's open source. You, you, you can check this out. Don't worry, the slides are already open, uh, available, so you can click on my presentation and follow if you want. And all those links are clickable. And how we have implemented it is we have one project for every schema um, code base. Uh, there, is, there are an application layer that we use to create, to link Git repository. So one application is one repository. And we have multiple pipelines to test on various DBMS and various versions, and a workflow to orchestrate multiple pipelines. And there is there are webhooks. So whenever a developer push a branch, there is a webhook that sent to CDS to test the same branch. And the workflow goes like this. We have uh, the UI with all those tests. And there is the webhook that goes from the first pipeline and the second one. And if we click on this pipeline, we can see that we have multiple steps. The first one is the stage one with an offline check. We will check. Syntaxy, uh, syntaxly or, or something uh, right inside the files and only inside the files. We uh, have a second stage where we run online tests. Uh, CDS is able to create Docker containers running Postgres and run the migration for us and see by the status if it, it's OK or if it fails. And we also provide hierarchy, hierarchy to create a nice diagram of your, um, of your uh, schema. So 
at the end, the, and here we publish the schema on a, a, a website, internal website, so then the developer can use the, uh, that diagram directly inside their uh, documentation. So at the end, they have a visualization of their schema and also test, of course. And at the end of the process, in Bitbucket, we have either the build is a success or fail. And if it fails, it blocks the, the merge operation. So if it fails, there are also error messages that help us from, that release us uh, some work so developers are autonomous in the review if they provide bad uh, migration. No. Uh, this happens whenever they push a branch. So the, the, when they push, they already uh, can access the, the workflow. Uh, and later, they can create a pull request and when everything is okay. So it's early. And so now we, we ensure that uh, the, the migration are, are sane. Uh, but it's test without data. Sometimes we run on production and it fails because of data, because database store data and the schema can be dependent of the data. For test with the data, we use our backup system to move the ZFS snapshot first on the, what we call the filers, they are big servers with a lot of spinning disk to archive the ZFS snapshots and over SSH. And we use the same technique on what we call a dev server in a dev environment with where we start a new instance. We apply some anonymization procedure or it's not accessible at all. And some app can uh, reach the dev environment with near um, production data. So we can use this dev environment to perform a test on the schema migration. So there is no impact on the business and we have a pretty uh, good estimation on what should the migration um, take time on production. Okay, so now we have test with and without data. We need to deploy uh, when it, it can be merged and we need to deploy on uh, the production infrastructure. So we already covered the code review part, developer create pull request, DBA review and merge, and then we can still go on the infrastructure with SSH, git pool, and run SQL migrate. And for safety reason, we are using lock timeout because some statement can be locked even if it wasn't locked on a development environment because of the busyness of the database, of the concurrency. So we have implemented this lock timeout to two seconds, which is okay for us. Um, and we can retry later on uh, on a less busy time and eventually it will be okay. But it's safety measure because sometimes, uh, even if you have taken all the steps, you can be blocked by this. So downtime is now under control. But one of the pain points where we still need to connect to the infrastructure, but where? So I will talk about the inventory part. The first solution we have found is Okay, we are DBA, so DBAs, so we know databases, so what, why not creating a database that tracks all the databases? So we have created a database with four tables, one to register the databases, linked to a schema repository table, and databases are part of a cluster, and all the clusters have hosts with all the roles. This is simple, and on top of that, we have provided a REST API so we can, with a HTTP call, uh, 
easily find and search for databases. But every change has to be declared. And it's very easy to miss an event here because it was populated by us, humans, and we can fail. Uh, so we have to track when we add a cluster, host, database, git repository, remove the same. It's very easy to miss an event. And it was 100% it was homemade. So we abandoned this project in favor of console. We use now service discovery. Um, console is a distributed and highly available data store um, working with local agent and it's uh, also open source. And you, it works like this. There is a bunch of servers, the console servers, and an agent on each server we have. And the agent talk to the servers, the console servers, and say, hello, my name is Node1, I'm part of Cluster1, and I have DB1 and DB2. All the time, constantly. And if something change, the change will be de detected. So there are multiple concepts. We have nodes, so it registered the name, the IP address, and some metadata of the host, and services, the da and the database is here. And it's secure because there are access control lists managed by tokens, and this uses encryption on the transport. So we have a static configuration for the part that are never move, like the server type, which, uh, for example, a host can be a PostgreSQL uh, server, or MySQL server, or Filer, or anything else, this role will never change. Like, it is server type. And the role can be a, a node, more than that, just after, a load balancer or backup, and this will never change. And like the cluster, to identif identify where, uh, then the number of the, the, the host. And there is a, a, a dynamic configuration for the moving parts. For example, the sub role, a node can be at any time either a primary or a replica because of automatic failovers. And so the sub role, we have to discover it and register it on, in a dynamic way. And of course, databases, because databases can be moved from one cluster to another. So we use a dynamic uh, mechanism here. So now, Consul has also a UI, but also but also a REST API, we can use it programmatically, but for the presentation I will use the UI. We can search for services, and where is my database? For example, here, the test database. We can search for the test, and the test is registered on three hosts. The backup one, the first node, which is a replica, and the second one, which is a primary. So now, it's easy to find the database. And it will, we won't miss any event. So what databases are behind the repository now? This kind of relationship is harder to discover in, on the host themselves, so we uh, have decided to use the Git repository and a special file there, so when the merge event will happen, we will see in the payload this relationship. So we have a key, Databases, we have also other keys. Uh, we have the region, here the US, and a list of databases. It can be test, it can be anything, and uh, so the, the, the relationship is declared here. So now we can find our databases. Okay, how can we improve that? By using automation, because now we have the billing blocks, we want it to be smooth. For that, we use Ansible. Ansible is dead simple, really. If you want to automate and you don't, want, don't know how, where to start and you have a similar infrastructure, like the old ways, not Kubernetes or something, you can seriously consider Ansible. So we have, uh, it works with an inventory, registering host and 
group of hosts. Hosts are the servers we want to connect to, or Ansible wants to connect to, and groups are a way to group multiple uh, hosts sharing the same um, attributes. And there are a notion of playbooks, uh, which are group of tasks running on uh, groups, so multiple hosts. And there are modules, there are some smallest units, unit of code to execute on hosts. And it's, uh, you, you can write playbooks in YAML. Okay, once again, it's YAML. YAML is very rare, but don't be afraid. This is a simple YAML. <laughs> we, for schema regression, I would like to deep dive into the playbook that, uh, and give you a real world example. We have one block here to check arguments running on all because we want to fail fast. We don't want to connect to the host themselves and discover lately if there is an error. We want to check the variables before to fail fast. Then we can update the schema migration and we can target some specific host here, like the database name here. We have groups with the name of the database and we can combine with a sub role primary with the ampersand uh, sign. So here we, w we will run the migration on the primary host where the database name is registered. And there are multiple tasks, one to create directories, configuration files, cloning, git clone the, the schema, and run the migrations. So here is an example of a task calling a module, which is a built-in file of Ansible to create a list of directories. The state here is the directory and we loop over etc SQL migrate and varlib SQL migrate to create the required directories. We could use another tool to do that, but here it's easier for us inside the playbook to do it on demand because we create one configuration file for one database the one we want to run migration, and the database at that time is here, but can move, so we use it on demand. And templates, you are using Jinja. So here we, hold, we already have Jinja variables, and the, the configuration file is the, same, um, is the same. Then we use the git module to ensure the the branch are, uh, and the schema is up to date. And at the end, we run a command to run the wrapper with all the requir uh, required information. In reality, it's not a wrapper. We have created a module internally to register the times, the execution times, but uh, it's easier here to show you that you can run comments. The wrapper is not open source because it's only a little bit modified to have two migration paths. It's to avoid to use two uh, different, col um, different um, commands, but this, is, this was okay at that time. Right now, if we would redo the same, we will not recreate a wrapper, we will use SQL migrate and use automation to do the orchestration, yeah. But when the wrapper was created, there was no uh, automation at the time. And at the end, when we, you have wrote your, uh, written your, uh, your playbook, you can call the Ansible playbook command with some extra vars to define the arguments and the playbook, and it runs. And Ansible can be plugged with console. So we can use console to create our, our inventory using the dynamic inventory uh, feature. And it's open source. The, you, you can use it on your, on your own. And 
now Ansible needs to connect to the host. And until that time, the only uh, way to connect to the host is to go through what we call a bastion. It's an open source uh, project we have created to manage access uh, via SSH. It's like an SSH gateway. And it was uh, accessed by humans, but we can use it. The, the main feature here is all sessions are recorded. So everything you do on SSH are recorded somewhere for audit purposes. And um, we can't connect directly to, to server using SSH. And Ansible has to use this bastion to be compliant. So we decided to build a, a wrapper, we like wrapper, but this time it's open source, to plug Ansible with the bastion. And we hook the SSH executable with the wrapper and same for SFTP to copy some files because Antibel sometimes needs to copy some files uh, to execute them on um, remotely. Uh, you should use SFTP because SCP is deprecated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you don't have to use the wrapper if you don't have the same uh, restriction. It's it's easier to not use the wrapper in in that case. But if we if we would like to get this uh, a, a little step further, um, Ansible is run by a CLI tool by humans uh, without trustability because uh, or or. or hard traceability because you have to go through the bastion, this is managed by another team, you don't, ha you don't really know who, when, it's hard. So for that, and it's not always available, you have a CLI somewhere. For that we use AWX, because AWS will e is able to provide us a REST API and a web interface to manage and execute Ansible playbooks. But there are a lot of features and the, the main one are the use of personal accounts. When you are in a company, you would like to create personal account and you would like to use something existing. And we have, there is notifications, like alerting, we use Objeni for alerting. Some playbooks are critical if they are uh, not applied. So if they fail, and there is uh, an integration with the chat, uh, so we use WebEx, but it's a webhook. And we use schedule jobs to perform daily resources. And uh, of course the basics, the inventory management, source control management to git pool the code base of the playbooks and matching credentials to know how to connect to the server. It's like the SSH keys. So the web interface goes like this. You land on the, the on this page. You you go to the templates beca um, because templates are able to create jobs. Templates are like the playbooks, and you search for the one you want here to run the schema migrations. And you click run. You provide the argument in the survey click launch, and boom, you, you have your job that is scheduled, and it's success. Here it's a screenshot of the, our chat uh, system with the notification. And at the end, you can go back uh, through the web uh, UI to see the logs if you want to go in details. Yeah, it's better for the auditing system, but it's also a way to provide an API for plugging other system in an automated fashion. Because uh, it uh, we the the CI CD doesn't talk to uh, AWS. We just use it to test it locally. We don't 
use the CI CD to talk to AWX. We will see a little bit later where AWX is plugged, just right after that. But here, I've exposed uh, how humans use this, um, this uh, solution. And as a human, we can also use a CLI if you want to stay, uh, if we don't like UIs. And it's pretty similar to the Ansible playbook command. And we have the same information right in the terminal. But now, when we click merge, we would like to know that the merge has, a, uh, has happened and we want to automatically create jobs. And for that, Bitbucket has a, a feature, a hook, that can send messages through a Kafka queue. So we use those messages with a payload that, can, that we parse. And we have created another little piece of software. We call it Schema Consumer that consumes events from Kafka queue to create parse. Uh, we, uh, the, it also filter and parse um, events to create jobs with the right uh, arguments. And so we, are, we have the code reviews, the test, the merge event that goes to Kafka, and then in every environment, we have an instance of schema consumer talking to AWX, um, having information from the inventory, going through the bastion and executing playbook on the infrastructure everywhere. And when we click merge, this is our chat. For example, here it's run on the Canada, Canadian infrastructure in some test infrastructure and European infrastructure all at the same time. So we can now apply everywhere. And what if something fails? Because a failure can happen. Uh, we have notification, we have the chat, but uh, if we are off or on a weekend, we don't see the chat, there are on-call alerts if needed. And even that, we can miss some notification. For example, if the notification system is down. And we have implemented, um, integrated a check based on NRP, uh, which is, um, Nagios Remote Procedure Executor, or something like this. Uh, we use it for monitoring the host dentures. So it was already existing at that time, and we use it in Ethinga. So every host can detect the configured um, databases and detect if there is a drift from uh, the schema. So, we have the alert here, and the same with uh, afterwards, if something fails. So, we are alerted. So, in the end, sorry for the notification, but I'm a huge, fa huge par uh, fan of Linkin Park, and uh, here in Los Angeles, they are from here, so <laughs> we are Great, we have all of achievement we, ha we didn't have in the past. And it's like heaven. Perfect, right? Yeah, there are some issues. There are problems with highly concurrent repositories. For example, we have multiple features uh, developed at the same time, but none competing with each other. Uh, there are we developers create multiple files fr uh, from various de developers and inside the same de the repository. Um, this is an example of a repository. In one month, there are seven pull requests. And one pull request can have multiple files in there. So the first sol uh, solution is to use the same file names. So you take the last one, you name it plus one, and it should be okay. Okay, let's, let's see what happens. So we have V02 here, and the first being merged win. So there is a conflict. 
So a conflict means the developer needs to rebase, and developers hate to rebase. So what if we use predicted file names? We predict in advance what files will be merged. So here we have v02 and v03. We need works on the v02 and merge the v03. And later we merge the v02. So in reality we have v01, v03, then v02. And what happens if we need to roll back the v02? The tool we use will roll back the latest version, not the latest supply. So we will roll back the wrong migration. So it's a problem. A solution for that is to use some, a declarative model and not going from one state to another and how you can do this, but more you have those objects and you your, uh, make everything you want to apply those objects instead. There are multiple solutions, like Atlas, which is compatible with MySQL and Postgres, but we don't have tested them and even schema, but it's only MySQL only. And there are maybe a lot of them out there. So if you know one, uh, one tool that solves those problems, please go tell me after that. Um, uh, I would like some feedbacks. We also have a, a problem with granular deployment. For example, if we need to merge, but not everywhere, because we would like to test on, uh, on a test environment before uh, and see if the feature we are trying to build is okay, uh, be instead of deploying everywhere at the same time. Solution would be to use some, uh, the, to deploy here, and if it's okay, yes, deploy everywhere, on non-critical, then criticals, and no rollback. But this is kind of hard to do it right. Um, do we have to implement a Git workflow? Like the, ma the main branch is something like a development branch, and sometimes we build some release, and we target the release branch to deploy everywhere. Or another solution, we are trying to figure out uh, how to implement this. So it will be implemented, but it's not ready yet. And testing on real data. This is a problem because we have a dev environment here, but it's not available everywhere. It's only in Europe, in the spirit, but not for every cluster, so we can't use it everywhere. And some application can modify the data, so we can have conflict on modifications that are not on production. And an animation is hard, so we would like to trash this environment. And for that, a solution is to either, uh, uh, instead of using the dev server, we, use the, we would like to use the backup server and create uh, instances based on the latest ZFS snapshot directly on the backup host, because it does nothing, uh, it does only the replication part. So we can use these uh, resources, those resources to do this uh, operation. And we have 100% uh, data of the, the production, with a little lag, but it's better than today. And the last part, because I'm a little bit late, is schema consumer. Schema consumer is 100% homemade. It's not open. Uh, it's written in Python. It's OK. But we have to maintain it. We have to add missing feature, patch securities, uh, vulnerabilities, and stuff. And there is a solution. Uh, there is event-driven Ansible that matches exactly the feature we have implemented which is, it works like playbooks, Ansible playbooks, but instead of uh, a human or uh, something that creates a job, it looks for an event source. 
And here we can use it to uh, consume Kafka events, but you can consume a web API, uh, different various event-driven sources. And there is, this is the same syntax as Ansible, so it's easy to move, easy to use, and it can be used to create jobs on AWS. You can also run playbooks directly, but we will use to create jobs on AWS where everything is already defined. And it's easy to contribute. In fact, I have contributed two patches to adapt the authentication of Kafka and add basic O to AWS controller. So it's really easy to, to update and it's open. So it's way better than a, a private solution. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. So the last word will be for the developers out, uh, out there, uh, SQL is your friend. Please don't um, be afraid of SQL. Uh, it will make your DBAs happy. And for DBAs out there, automation is easy. Ansible is, is very easy. It's not hard to um, automate things that you do multiple times a day. Uh, you should consider, consider this solution. And of course, this project hasn't been done in uh, in one week or one month. It's multiple years of iterations. So if you would like to start from now, you can be inspired by the result, but you shouldn't deploy a complex infrastructures, infrastructure like us. You should start small and iterate. And of course, we have made a lot of errors and the errors uh, design the final solution. So. It's okay to have errors as soon as you learn from them. And I would like to thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure uh, to be uh, accepted in this conference. So, uh, so I would like to thank the organizer and, and that's it. <laughs> Questions? So the question is, is how we detect drift or differences uh, inside the database and the schema. Uh, in fact, we don't detect the, what's inside the database, but only the applied migrations that has, are not applied. Only that. Uh, this is a major drawback because we are not, uh, there are probably uh, differences because the tooling system has been deployed after the databases exist. So there are probably differences. And for that, the declarative model can be a solution. Uh, if you have a table that managed by the system, uh, it will, in theory, it should be able to detect the uh, differences between the, the actual structure and apply the difference. <laughs> I mean, I would love to see a system like that that works like Django migration that I can use for all my systems. Have you investigated that at all? Or so the, the question is, um, there is um, a mechanism in Django migration that solved the concurrency issue. And if I have uh, any feedback on this, uh, the answer is no. We don't have any experience at the DBS side with Django. There are some uh, developers using Django, and um, I don't have an answer uh, for that, sorry. <laughs> yeah? Do you have any plans to integrate this with the, the, the pipeline for actual application deployment? I, mean, I would assume oh. internal tools are not, I mean, you probably don't have a true product owner or a, someone who's managing releases, but it would seem that ultimately in migration, there are new types. 
to features, uh, and again, obviously, internal tools supporting as opposed to external tools that, that customers see. And yeah. Do you have any plans to try and integrate those two processes? So the, the, the question is, uh, do we have any plans to integrate application migration uh, with database migration at the same time? And it's a major feature that uh, is being asked by developers. Uh, today, we don't have a so solution for that. It's in our mind. So when we have a solution, we will share it, of course. There is a, a big problem with that because a lot of applications are written in different languages and there is not a single way to integrate uh, this migration with all those heterogeneous uh, uh, languages. The only way we can do that is provide automation and combine with other automations so they can orchestrate multiple things together. Yeah. Any question? All right. Thank you, everybody. And if you have any question, I will be uh, around there. Thank you.